All right, so today we're going to finish up with uh, female reproductive anatomy and physiology, <clears throat> and we're going to start out with uh, oogenesis. And you can see a schematic here of oogenesis. This occurs in the ovary, and this is the process by which an undifferentiated germ cell uh, or eventually will become a uh, egg cell that is released in ovum is produced uh, or is taken through this path to generate a 23 chromosome ova. Egg production is another name for ovogenesis, and it is analogous to spermatogenesis in the male. It is going to be a combination of mitosis and my meiosis events. resulting in a haploid, 23 chromosomes for humans, a haploid cell, which is going to be vital for fertilization. Now the process of ovogenesis and egg production is a cyclical process. It's always a cyclical pattern. The cyclical pattern results in typically only one egg fully maturing per cycle, which is about one month in length. Now, there are two different versions of the cyclical pattern that can occur, and they're going to be cycles. And so we'll organize oogenesis each month into one of these two cycles. The first of the cycles we're going to refer to as the sexual cycle. And a oogenesis cycle will be considered a cycle, a sexual cycle when there is no pregnancy that's occurred. Sexual cycle will consi consist of two concurrent cycles. And these two concurrent cycles are going to be occurring in two anatomically unique regions. One will be uh, in the ovary, we're going to call that the ovarian cycle. in the uterus, and we'll call that the uterine cycle. This can also be referred to as the menstrual cycle, cycle as this leads to menses. The other possibility for oogenesis is a reproductive cycle. And it will be considered a reproductive cycle when a pregnancy does occur. So let's break down the steps here. Steps of oogenesis. The whole process is actually initiated and begins prior to birth. In a female fetus, as it undergoes its fetal development, one of the things that will happen is we'll begin to develop germ cells. And these germ cells will be contained within a tissue called the germ line. And in the fetus, those germ cells will begin to differentiate. And 
going to differentiate leading to what's known as an oogonia. And this oogonia becomes a pool of oogonia that will continue to proliferate until around fetal age of five months. At this point, in the fetal age of five months, you've had enough germ cell differentiation to oogonia that will have about six million individual oogonia that are present. And these will be divided into the two ovaries, about three million each. So about three million oogonia per ovary. Now, out of these six million total, three million per ovary, we're just going to have a small percentage of these oogonia that will start to undergo meiosis one. So they start the process of meiosis 1. As they initiate meiosis 1, the oogonia are going to form the primary oocyte. So you can see here that we go from that primary germ cell in the embryo or the fetus undergoing differentiation to form our oogonia or oogonia. We'll have uh, this produced through mitotic division, so we have about 6 million of them present. Then from there, the oogonium, about 6 million of them, some of them will become primary oocytes within the ovary. And they'll uh, be signified as a primary oocyte as they start meiosis 1. Now, there will be a large section of that 6 million population that will not begin the process of meiosis 1. Those that don't begin meiosis 1 are just simply going to be reabsorbed. From fetal age of 5 months until about the age uh, of 6 months, so postnatal 6 month age, completed this process of starting meiosis 1. It's completed by post natal age 6 months. So little baby has been born, little baby girl is born, and a large number of these primary oocytes that have begun meiosis 1. Again, a large number of the oogonium have been reabsorbed. And so at six months, we're looking at about two million that are present, and that's going to be about one million per ovary. So about a million per ovary will have these primary oocytes that have begun meiosis 1. Additional Aging and development occurs from six months postnatal uh, and will continue prior to just about puberty. At this point, we'll continue to have some atresia So this means that additional eggs. So from the 2 million, we'll have additional eggs that are reabsorbed to that atretic process. Leaving at the point of puberty about 400,000. And 
that's about 200,000 for ovary. And this, 400,000, is considered the reproductive supply. From that reproductive supply, we will ovulate and release a mature egg that is ready to fertilize about 450 in a typical reproductive lifetime. Now, once we get to the point where we have our primary oocyte that's present. Again, this is an egg or a cell rather that started meiosis one, and we're going to have about 450 of them that are going to be ovulated. By the time we get to puberty, we're going to begin to undergo what's known as folliculogenesis. And this is going to be development of the follicle, which is the support structure that you can see here that helps to support the egg as it goes through the rest of its maturation process. So, meiosis one will be resumed at adolescence. So here's just another look at it. Uh, you can see um, that we have our primary oocyte that's ready to finish off meiosis one. So we're going to actually get the division here. Uh, this will be referred to as the secondary oocyte. This is what's resuming at adolescence. And it's actually going to be triggered by the hormone follicle stimulating hormone, FSH. Stimulate from those 400,000 remaining eggs, the reproductive slides, uh, supply. FSH will stimulate a group of eggs, typically between 6 and 12 will be selected and stimulated by FSH and will finish the meiosis 1 process. Genesis, which is developing or uh, uh, dealing with the development of the egg, so egg development, is at this point coupled with the development of the follicle, which we call follicular genesis. So we have the egg itself and then the supporting cells called the follicle that will help to develop the process. After we enter meiosis one or complete meiosis one, we're going to continue down this path coupled oogenesis to folliculogenesis. Now the fate of the ovulated egg is going to depend on the development of pregnancy. Without pregnancy, we'll have the sexual cycle. With pregnancy, we'll develop the, uh, the we'll undergo a reproductive cycle. So once a month, this small group of 6 to 12 eggs will be stimulated to go through the rest of oogenesis. A follicle will, will develop uh, in conjunction with uh, the egg. And if no pregnancy occurs, it's going to be a sexual cycle. And this is a schematic showing the ovarian cycle, body temperature, the anterior pituitary hormones, ovarian hormones, and then the uterine thickness during the sexual cycle. Okay, so the sexual cycle is going to last, 
on average, 28 days in humans. As you can tell from this figure, both the pituitary gland and the ovarian hormone and ovarian hormones are being produced. So this is a endocrine regulated mechanism. It's regulated by the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. Again, we have two different cycles. The ovarian cycle, which is what's occurring in the ovary, and then we have the uterine cycle, which is, happen what's, what, what, which is what is happening within the uterus. So through the ovarian cycle, we're going to have two separate phases. The follicular phase and the luteal phase. Starting with the follicular phase, again, we have an individual egg from that group of 6 to 12 that has been selected to go through the full maturation process. The other remaining uh, 5 to 11 eggs are going to go through atresia. They're just going to be reabsorbed. We have one follicle that will become the dominant follicle, one egg that will become the dominant egg. And during the follicular phase, we're going to continue to go through development and growth of the follicle until the point of ovulation. Uh, the timeline here for the follicular phase of the ovarian cycle always reference to the menstruation, uh, the menstrual flow, and menses, the onset of menses, the beginning of uterine sloughing, is always classified as day one. The follicular phase will start there at day one and will continue until ovulation. On average, ovulation occurs at about day 14 after the onset of menstruation. During this time, 6 to 12 ovaries, uh, I'm sorry, 6 to 12 oocytes that have been stimulated to undergo this process are going to be prepared to support just a single, typically a single oocyte called the dominant follicle. Now, obviously, we occasionally have more than just one uh, oocyte that goes through this process, and that's when we would get uh, twins that um, they come from two separate eggs, so they're not identical twins. But normally, it's just a single dominant follicle, and it goes through a preparatory process so that it can be populated. Now, what you can see here is as we go through, here's the end of menses. This is the end of the menstrual flow, and we have this time period here between end of menses and then the point of ovulation. We begin to have this increase, this small little hump here that lasts several days of follicle-stimulating hormone shown here in the greenish color. So follicle-stimulating hormone levels will begin to increase. And that release of follicle stimulating hormone is what stimulates the follicle to grow. So this elevation in the FSH is going to is going to stimulate the growth and development of this follicle, the supporting cells that aid in the development of the oocyte to an ova. The cells of the follicle are called 
granulosa cells. These begin to surround the oocyte. These granulosa cells are FSH responsive. The FSH will stimulate estradiol. Which is a potent estrogen. It will stimulate estradiol release. As estradiol is released from the oocyte, which you can see estradiol levels are now beginning to increase here in response to the development of the follicle as FSH stimulates estradiol release, the follicle is going to respond to this estrogen, uh, estrogen release and produce receptors. And those receptors will include receptors for FSH, for LH, and for estradiol itself. With the expression of the receptors in the granulosa cells of the follicle, the follicle now becomes hormone sensitive. Estrogen or the estradiol will also further stimulate the sensitivity to the gonadotropin release hormone. Now that the follicle is primed to be hormone sensitive, we're going to move into some later stages of the follicular phase. And during these later stages of the follicular phase, follicle stimulating hormone, you can see the secretion begins to drop. Secretion slowly decreases. And of the follicles that were present, six to twelve follicles, only one should become dominant. And so we'll have several follicles that are not dominant. And these follicles that are not dominant begin to suffer from those lower FSH levels. Now there was one follicle that became hormone sensitive first. And so it now is hormone sensitive and it continues to develop. But the ones that never really became fully hormone sensitive, we begin to lose FSH levels. They no longer respond. Estrogen's not being produced. We don't get the same number of receptors produced. And eventually these follicles undergo atresia. They become atretic and they are reabsorbed. And so we're left over with one dominant follicle. Now at this point we have our dominant follicle and you can see that we're going to begin to increase luteinizing hormone levels. So LH secretion increases. We typically only have one follicle, the dominant follicle, that is still present and has not gone, undergone atresia. And that dominant follicle continues its growth. And as it continues its growth, it is going to reach what we call maturity. 
when it reaches maturity, which happens right here before ovulation, we get a very large follicle called the graphene follicle. This can also be referred to as simply a mature follicle. And this is going to be the follicle that will undergo ovulation, which will be our next step here. At the point of ovulation, about 14 days into the cycle, we're going to have hormonal changes that are considered radical. Estradiol levels have continued to increase this whole time. As estradiol levels continue to increase, eventually there will be stimulation of surges. We will have a luteinizing hormone spike, which you can see here in blue. At the point of ovulation, LH levels are going to spike up over a very short period of time. We're also going to have an FSH spike. However, this will be a lesser spike. You can see that it's not much higher than the levels observed during the earlier parts of the follicular phase. Now, at this point, this primary oocyte or this uh, ovum that's getting ready to ovulate is still not completely finished meiosis one. So the ovum is going to complete meiosis one. As this happens, the follicle is also going to begin to swell, and so this area here called the antrum, which is a fluid-filled space, is going to continue to fill up with some more fluid, and this is going to uh, weaken both the follicle and the ovarian wall. leading to rupture of the graphene follicle. And this rupture of the graphene follicle, which you can see here, is what actually causes egg release. So here you can see the process, the ovum is released and it's very, uh, in comparison to the fallopian tube, it's much, much smaller than this. It's a very small little speck. Most of the time, we're going to release an ovum nearby the opening to the oviduct, which has these finger-like structures called the fibrile. The oviduct itself will swell with blood flow, and that higher presence of blood flow, every time the heart beats now, those fimbriae are going to beat in a rhythmic pattern, and the egg is going to be swept to the oviduct. Again, it's going to be the fimbriae of the fundus. We're going to beat in this rhythmic pattern to pull that over the, the ovum into the oviduct.
that is really, really, really the heartbeat. So at this point, the ovum will continue to travel down. The uh, oviduct fertilization is actually going to occur pretty far up the oviduct. Uh, when fertilization occurs, we end up going through the rest of meiosis two, and we're left over with an egg that's been fertilized plus the kind of the leftovers, which we call a polar body. And the egg continues down here for about four or five days uh, until on about day five to six, it will undergo implantation in the uterine lining where it will now sit for the next 38 weeks. If this were a sexual cycle, we would move into the luteal phase. So back to this picture, picture we've just ovulated the egg and we're going to undergo the luteal phase. The luteal phase is going to occur from ovulation on average at day 15 to menstruation and ending on day 28. So this is where we'll progress if there is no fertilization. Fertilization has not occurred. We will progress through the luteal phase. If there was fertilization, we will shift away from the sexual cycle, and this will lead to the reproductive cycle. Now, the graphene follicle, most of it's left over. We have some of it that ruptures and, and, and leaves the ovary with the ovum. But most of it's left over and it is basically scar tissue. And it will be inundated with blood. So that antral space here, it ruptures and it's left over and it begins to fill up with blood. And that blood will clot. This blood-filled, clot-filled antral space forms a structure in the ovary called the corpus luteum. This tissue is very responsive to hormones, especially luteinizing hormones. So it will be regulated by luteinizing hormone. Once the corpus luteum has developed, it begins to secrete both progesterone and estrogen or estradiol. So you can see that the corpus luteum here as it's been developed, we'll get these increases in both progesterone and estradiol. This estradiol was being produced by the graphene follicle. This is being produced by the corpus luteum. Now, the presence of progesterone. Progesterone is what is going to prepare the uterus for possible pregnancy. We also are going to have another hormone called inhibin that will be produced. And this is produced directly by the ovary that has just undergone ovulation. And inhibin, just like its name suggests, is an inhibitor and inhibits gonadotropin secretion.
and it works alongside of estrogen and progesterone. So the corpus luteum, after several days, will begin to shrink. This is known as involution. And as it shrinks and degrades away, Becomes a structure known as the corpus albicans. And this is basically leftover scar tissue from the rupture during ovulation. Once it becomes the corpus albicans, and scar tissue is no longer capable of inhibiting the pituitary gland. So you can see here, we are going to begin to have luteinizing hormone begin to increase back up because we no longer have that inhibition occurring on the pituitary gland. So the gonadotropins, uh, again, are going to begin to be produced. And this leads towards the cycle repeating itself. Now, progesterone levels here in purple must remain high in order to capture the corpus luteum. As the ovum develops, and implants, it begins to generate a tissue called chorion. And chorion is going to begin to generate a hormone called human chorionic gonadotropin. Human chorionic gonadotropin. Some of you may recognize this as the hormone that is tested by an early pregnancy test, an EPT, something you can get off the shelf at uh, the, the pharmacy or at Walmart. Human chorionic gonadotropin, as it's produced, feeds back onto the corpus luteum, and it's said to capture the corpus luteum. So it captures the corpus luteum. This prevents this prevents the corpus luteum from becoming the corpus albicans, so that the corpus luteum continues to generate progesterone. And as it continues to generate progesterone, this will maintain the uterine thickness. As long as progesterone levels are high, you can see as it begins to dip off, this is when we begin to lose our uterine lining. If this continues, we would continue to have our thickened uterine lining, which would be supportive to pregnancy. So we have to capture the corpus luteum by generating human chorionic gonadotropin, which is produced by the chorion, which is the, one of the first tissues that's generated by the embryo. If no chorion develops because there's no embryo, we don't produce chorionic gonadotropin, we do not capture the corpus luteum, and we allow that scar tissue to uh, further develop. We lift the pituitary inhibition, and you can see that follicle stimulating hormone levels begin to go back up, and we go through follicular development once again. Now, we also have some stuff that's going on in the uterus, and I've already alluded to some of the things going on here in the uterus. But during the se sexual cycle, the ovarian cycle is only one side of the equation. The menstrual cycle 
or uterine cycle is the other side of the equation. And this is going to model and detail what is occurring in the uterus. And as you can see, this is going to occur alongside of the ovarian cycle. And it's going to be broken up into four phases. The four phases are going to detail how thick the uterine lining is. The first is the proliferative phase. During the proliferative phase, we have rebuilding of the endometrial layer, endometrial layer called the stratum functionalis. And so during this phase, we begin to increase the thickness of the menstrual lining, I'm sorry, the uterine lining. We'll then move into the secretory phase. During the secretory phase, we will have fluid secretion that further helps to thicken stratum functionalis. The third phase will be the premenstrual phase. And during the premenstrual phase, we will have the endometrium. beginning to degrade. And really the big thing that happens here is we have an interrupted blood supply. During the secretory phase, we have an increase in the concentration of the spiral arteries that bring blood supply in to maintain the thickened uh, endometrial lining, that blood supply is going to be interrupted. We begin to see a loss of the nutrients required to maintain the thickened lining. And then we move into the menstrual phase. And during the menstrual phase, this is when we'll have mechanical dismemberment of the endometrium, uh, endometrial sloughing. where that thickened tissue on the inner wall of the uterus, the uterine lining, begins to flow away from the body, uh, out of the uterus, through the vaginal cavity, producing the menstrual fluid that is released from the female reproductive system at the end of the luteal phase beginning of the follicular phase during this process called menses. <laughs>